welcome to Chatham House. Uh, it is, it's lovely to see all of you on a Monday evening, um, and what a, what a wonderful um, reason to be here, for so many reasons, of which we're, we are going to hear about. I am tremendously honored, and I don't say that lightly, um, to be introducing and welcoming, not for the first time, um, but for perhaps one of the most special occasions, two of the most distinguished speakers that have that come to Chatham House. So it really is an honor to welcome Professor Margaret McMillan and Professor Sir Lawrence Friedman to Chatham House. They will be very well known to all of you, not only for their speaking, um, but of course for their writing. Uh, today's um, discussion centers around the 100 year anniversary of the Paris Peace Conference and the, the many contributions that have been written in the current volume of International Affairs, which of course is our journal here at Chatham House, of which we are very proud of. I think it's actually quite unique. Uh, one thing that I would say before saying just a few words about the speakers, they don't need introductions, um, is that 1919, of course, is a tremendously important year, but 1920, and therefore 2020, is also a tremendously important year because, of course, it marks the 100-year anniversary of the creation of Chatham House. So our centenary uh, is, is coming up, and that is something that um, we hope to hear a lot from you about and that I know that you will hear a lot from us about. So this is the beginning of something extraordinarily special, and um, what better way to begin the conversation. <laughs> professor McMillan is professor of history at the University of Toronto. She was formerly warden of St. Anthony's College. Um, she is a public intellectual historian as well as one of the most important historians of the First World War. Her books are well known to you, but I'll just mention one. Uh, the War That Ended Peace, uh, written in 2014. Um, Professor Friedman, Emeritus Professor of War Studies at King's College London. Anybody who's been through King's College London and studied political science, international history, international relations, if they were not unlucky, has had a class or at least a lecture with uh, Laurie Friedman and, and benefited from it. His most recent book, The Future of War, A History, was published in 2017, and he is obviously a very regular um, presence here at Chatham House. So I won't say any more. I think it's best to have both of you speak to us. Um, I might come back with a few questions, and we'll open it up to all of you. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for well, joining us. Thank you for such a nice, nice introduction, and, and great pleasure to be here with, with Professor Friedman. Um, it is quite nice to see the issue finally out. Um, as I needn't tell most of you, doing these jobs takes a lot of back and forth, and we had long discussions about it. There were three of us editing it, but two have fallen by the wayside, at least for this evening. One of our co-editors, Patrick Quinton Brown, has just got off a, something like a 10-hour flight from Vancouver. And so I think may get here, but we, we, we hope. I, I don't think see him here. And Anna and Menon, who, of course, you will have been seeing, seeing involved much in the discussions of um, the current state of British politics and its relationship with the European Union, is, I think, to, at, the, at the moment at Westminster. Um, he's, <laughs> life, he says, has been taken over by this. And so I will speak for the two of them. I hope do them justice. It's been a very interesting experience, and it's been wonderful to have such support from, from Chatham House and from the editors of the international, of international Affairs. This was a special commemorative issue, and I think anniversaries can be overdone, but they can be very important. They can be times when you step back a little bit and think about a longer picture and, and a bigger picture and think about the context of things that are happening in the present day. And we thought that 2019 was a moment to look at the whole century since the end of the First World War and try and see what had changed and, and what had remained the same. And I think we also had, as part of our purpose, to bridge what has sometimes been a rather unfortunate gap and, and sometimes a growing gap between political scientists who specialize in international relations and international historians. We don't talk to each other enough. Um, international historians tend to think that political scientists have too much theory, and political scientists think we don't have enough. And I think we need to talk to each other. I think international political, political, international relations done by political scientists needs to have an awareness of history. 
and historians need to have an awareness of some of the great theoretical issues and some of the great debates that are taking place. And so we found this issue useful for that as well as, as thinking. And what we tried to ask and we encouraged our contributors to do and we tried to do ourselves was look at what was comparable then and now, but also look at what is different. Because clearly the world of 2019 is not the same as the world of 1919. And, and we wanted to try and get out of our thinking what, where it had changed, but where things had remained the same. And that's always a difficult thing to do, particularly when you're in the middle of events. But let me suggest some of the things that we thought as we commissioned the articles and, and discussed them with the people who are writing them, we thought were perhaps the same as the period just before and after the First World War. Great power rivalry. And this was something that was very much there and I think fueled by nationalism. And I think we're seeing something similar today. And if you look at the response of China, for example, to any criticism of what it does from other powers, you get a, a highly nationalistic response, you know, a response that China will not be told what to do by other powers. And if you look at the way in which the United States often responds to um, criticisms or, or controversies or opposition from other states, you, you will see something of the same. We also had, in the period around the First World War, new powers emerging on the scene. And, and the question always is, is how they fit in and, and whether they become disruptive or they become part of some sort of international order. Then it was Japan and the United States. Today, China and countries such as, as Brazil and India. The period 100 years ago was also one of great globalization. We, we tend, I think, naturally enough to think that what we're doing is new and exciting and has never been done before. But that period was a period comparable today in, in terms of globalization, including communications. In some ways, I think you could argue the development of the telegraph network around the world, that speedy, that network that made it possible to know what was happening on the other side of the world almost in, instantaneously is as important as or was as important as the development of the internet is today. I and mean, I think it, it's hard to underestimate just how important the transformation in communications was. And of course, it wasn't just telegraphs. It was steamships. It was railways. It was the possibility of moving peoples around the world on a very large scale. And that was a period when there were huge movements of population, just as there have been today, huge development of international trade, and a huge movement of investment around the world. And as well, in that period, and I think we're seeing it again today, there was resistance to a lot of the change. There were those who felt that the change was pulling out the things from their lives that they felt were important, was destroying things that they valued. And you got a number of populist parties, again, before and after the First World War, that played on those fears, the fears of rapid change, the fears that particular groups were losing their livelihoods. In Vienna, for example, there was a political party, quite often anti-Semitic, headed by Karl Luger, who was the mayor of Vienna, which really appealed to the small artisans and shopkeepers whose livelihoods were being destroyed by mass industrialization and by the appearance of, of mass department stores. And there was, as now, a tendency to look for particular people to blame for the changes that were taking place and for the loss of livelihood and, and often for the, just simply for the loss of status. And so you got particular groups, often immigrant, immigrant groups, being demonized. In the period before the First World War, it was often Jews coming from Eastern Europe, moving into the big cities of Europe, moving to London, moving to Vienna, moving to Paris who were blamed for some of the changes that were taking place that people found so disruptive. And I think there was a lot of questioning in the period, again, around the First World War about, is all this happening too fast? What is happening to our society? Are the things that have kept our societies together being, being destroyed? Are we, are we facing um, an, an enemy? Are we facing social disintegration? And you had political parties appearing, like the ones in Vienna, but elsewhere, socialist parties or parties on the right which often had, I think, legitimate grievances, often had real concerns they were expressing, but tended to attack institutions such as representative government. They attacked their own elites. They attacked capitalism, um, highly critical of the international order. And I think these are things that we're seeing today. But as I say, one of the difficult things is always to work out what has changed and what hasn't changed and what is really new and what is really something that we have seen before. Among the changes, and I'm not sure my co-editors would agree with me entirely, but luckily they're not here. <laughs> Among the changes, I think we are seeing a world that's perhaps even more globalized than the one of, of 100 years ago. 
a world that is certainly more diverse, just at, at, at the level of states. There are far more states playing a part in the international order than, than used to. There are far more players. And there are also probably, I would argue, more non-state actors. The role of non-state actors, it seems to me, has become much more important. And there are far more organized NGOs. I mean, NGOs existed, international NGOs existed, of course, around the time of the First World War. You think of the Red Cross, or you think of the, anti -mo the great movement against slavery in the 19th century. But there are far more NGOs now, far more international organizations, both officials, uh, official and, and less official. I think there was an international public opinion, again, 100 years ago. But I think you would, I would argue there is more international public opinion today. And the possibility of mobilizing coalitions across borders and around the world is, is much greater than it was in the past. And we've seen new forms of international political organization emerge, emerging, both regional. I mean, the European U Union is unprecedented, really, um, I think, in European history, in a voluntary abdication of sovereignty where people accept a limitation of their sovereignty. This is not something they were forced into in an imperial way, but simply the limitation of their sovereignty. And among the articles we have is, is one by Anand Menon and um, Peter Jones, where they talk about the emergence of the European Union and argue that the tensions within the European Union today reflect a much longer history in Europe of oscillating between power politics as a way of managing relations or having relations managed on the continent, depending on the balance of power, for example, and more institutional arrangements, and the, the Congress, the, 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 con the, the, you know, the, the, the sorts of things that came out of the Congress of Vienna and again came out of and were being built in the 19th century, the Concert of Europe, for example. And I think you know, we, we, they do trace uh, a longer history for the European Union than simply the one of today and, and the tensions within it. Another change, and, and again, this is a, a controversial one, and I'm not sure if I entirely agree, but it's certainly an interesting argument, is the one that is made in an article by Una Hathaway and Scott Shapiro, where they argue on the lines of the book that they published that war has effectively been outlawed as a tool of state, that with the Pact of Paris in 1928 and, and with the subsequent victory of the Allies in the, in the Second World War, war was no longer seen as something that states could legitimately use to protect or enforce or promote their own interests. I'm not sure, as I say, I entirely agree with this argument because we seem to have an awful lot of wars and it's partly how you, how you define it. But it seems to me a very interesting argument that we have perhaps developed international norms which were simply not there 100 years ago. The same could be said on the article we have on imperialism by Jane Burbank, Jane Burbank and, and Fred Cooper, who again have argued that imperialism is something that simply has disappeared from the international order. I mean, there are vestiges of it. It certainly remains there in the vocabulary, and it's used as a way of attacking institutions or arrangements that particular players may not like. But that imperialism as a type of, of, of as a way of ordering the international order has disappeared. Um, again, I think interesting and I think worth challenging because it seems to me that imperialism takes many forms and it appears in different forms. And you know, there is talk now of creditor, cap creditor colonialism where a power will lend a great deal of money to a much smaller power and take in return um, national assets such as harbors, ports, um, railway infrastructure, mines. And this seems... Uh, certainly when we were reading it, and, and we raised this with them, it seems, it seems to us that this in many ways resembles an older kind of imperialism. Um, you know, when we look at the way in which China um, promotes the one belt, one road, um, much of that seems to me a kind of the sort of thing that the East India companies were doing in the 16th and 17th centuries and using much the same rhetoric that we're only doing this to bring shared prosperity and, and for the benefit of all. Um, as a Canadian, I'm rather conscious at the moment of, of the ways in which the Chinese are perhaps falling into older patterns. Um, you may not have followed, but we arrested um, the head of a big Chinese company in Canada at the request of the United States, and the Chinese authorities immediately arrested two Canadians. And when the Canadian government and the Canadian press complained about this, the, Canadian, the Chinese ambassador to Canada responded in a way which could have come straight out of the Middle Kingdom. He told us not to be impertinent. He told us to behave ourselves. He told us to be respectful of the Chinese and told us that he was very disappointed in us. It's very much like the letter that the Chenlong Emperor sent to George III at the end of the 18th century, and, and we felt properly rebuked. And one of the other things that the, we have a number of articles that looked at was 
of course, the big question of what is the United States up to internationally? Um, we come up with no clear answers, and that's possibly because the United States itself isn't entirely sure in which direction it's going. But I think we did, a number of our contributors did talk about US isolationism. Are we seeing a resurgence of US isolationism? And if so, is it repeating the older forms of isolationism, or is it a newer form? And I think Joe Nye, for example, in his article, argues that there is something new about it in that the old isolationism was really about turning um, America's back on the world and, and trying to have as little involvement as possible, but continuing to maintain American values and American institutions. And the new form of isolationism, particularly, I think, that expressed in certain parts of the Republican Party and, and on Fox News is more than that. It involves attacks, uh, attack, attacks on democracy itself and on a liberal international order, so that it is um, perhaps a more aggressive kind of isolationism and a more, uh, a more um, uh, I'm trying to think, d destructive kind of isolationism than you might have seen in the past. Um, Joseph Nye and Yuen Feng Kong, another contributor, also talk about the role of soft power and prestige in international relations. And Yuen Feng Kong, who's in Singapore, used to be at Oxford, looks at the ways in which the notion of prestige can be used as a tool in international relations and why certain powers would like to claim it. And he looks in particular, of course, at China. And China comes up quite a lot. Um, you know, what is China's role going to be in the world? How has it changed? In what ways is it likely to behave? And, and this, I think, is something, of course, that we're all worrying about. Rosemary Foote, in her article, looks at how China uses and interprets its own history as a way of dealing with the world, and, and sometimes as a, as a tool or weapon for dealing with the world. She looks at the way in which the century of humiliation, which started with the first opium war in 1839 and ended, according to the Chinese, in 1949 with the triumph of communism, is used by the Chinese government as an instrument um, and is used rhetorically when there is criticism of particular Chinese policy. And she looks, again, in particular, at the way China was treated in 1919 at the Paris Peace Conference, when the Chinese, who were an ally and who had been given to understand that their contr contributions to the Allied victory in the First World War, which, which were in, significant, would get China what it wanted at the Peace Conference, which was the turn of German, return of German concessions in China. And instead, the powers in Paris decided that China was basically not going to amount to anything in the next century, and Japan was. And so they gave Japan, which was also an ally, the German concessions in China. And that helped to spark a huge popular protest movement in China, um, which really led directly to the founding of the Chinese Communist Party. A number of those protesting in Beijing when the news came back from Paris about what was happening to China's demands went on to found the Chinese Communist Party. So a very, very important moment in Chinese history. And Rosemary Foote looks at the way in which this story of humiliation is still used by the Chinese government today and is still something that is taught very much in Chinese, Chinese schools. We looked quite a bit at the ways in which history can be used in international relations. It's clearly used as a source of, of lessons. As an historian, I tend to be very skeptical of this, but people will do it, and states people will do it. And my own article, um, which I wrote with Patrick Quinton Brown, was about the way in which history was used very much in Paris and has been used since as a basis for retribution, for claims, for justifying a particular course of action. We looked less at the lessons that the peacemakers drew on, although they did draw on lessons from the past, but we looked more at the way in which history became increasingly important as a basis for claims, because there was so much territory suddenly up for grabs at the end of the First World War as the result of the huge political changes in Europe and elsewhere, and colonies up for grabs, and a sense that you couldn't just go out and take territory because you wanted it. There had to be some recognition given to the people who lived in that territory, and there had to be some basis for the claims. And since other bases of claims had more or less fallen away, dynastic marriages no longer seemed to anyone a good basis for handing over one bit of land to another, as had happened so often in the past. And conquest no longer seemed a good basis for taking land. It, it was beginning to fall out of favor. And so history became increasingly important, history and ethnicity. And the two were so closely intertwined that I think it's very difficult to separate them. But a number of petitioners in Paris from states, would-be states that were emerging on the map of Europe, or from older states like Poland, 
put in their claims on the basis of history. And so history was dragged in as a justification for making claims. And you could probably imagine that when people went back through their history, they didn't choose the smallest possible amount of land that they could have had. And if you were Greece, you tended to go back to the classical period. And you, if you were Italy, you went back to the Roman period. And so you went to your biggest possible borders rather than the smallest. But it, it was something that was used. And, and we traced it through how history continued to be used, um, for example, after the Second World War, as the basis for colonial independence and as the basis for sovereignty and as, as the basis for certain borders. And then it became something that was simply a part of the international vocabulary. A number of our contributors also issued warnings. Um, Lawrence Friedman mm -hmm. issued many warnings, and I'm going to let him talk about them. Um, he talks about, in his article, and he'll, he'll say more about it himself, about the future of war, and raises, I think, a very interesting question about whether total war has really meant that we'll have no more major wars. And, and his answers, I should warn you, are not always very reassuring. Um, Barry Eichengreen wrote on the failure after 1919 to build and maintain an international trading order and a stable banking system and what that meant for the 1920s and 30s and again drew lessons with the period after 1945 and, and today. And I think this, I like to think these articles taken together really help to show the value of looking at the history and, and helping us think through particular current problems. And perhaps I'll end on, on one of our more positive articles. I think I've, I've mentioned them all, but perhaps we need a positive message to end on. Uh, Glenda Sluger from the University of Sydney wrote about the growth of international ideas and norms after 1919. And she accepts, and I think we'd all have to accept, that they didn't always come to fruition in the way they were expected to. The League of Nations was an idea which didn't do all that had been expected of it, but it was an important idea. It helped to embed certain concepts in our international discussions. The idea, for example, that, man, that former colonial territory should not be handed out as spoils of wars, but should be made mandates under the League of Nations. And you can argue that it was a completely cynical act that the great powers, Britain and France, simply took what they had wanted. But they had to do so under the League of Nations. They had to, at least on paper, take into account the well-being of the peoples who lived in those territories, and they had to file reports every year to the League of Nations. And so she would argue that certain things began to be expected in international relations, which became part of our vocabulary and became part of our discussions, and that this was a positive step forward. And so I think, on the whole, if you read the issue, you won't find it full of um, optimism. But I think you will find a sense that we have moved in some ways um, a long way and in some ways into a better world, that there are very important things that have changed, and that we need to now, as we look ahead, remember what those things are and, and, and continue to, to ask ourselves how we maintain the things which we have of value from the past at a time when there is considerable turbulence and, and considerable, considerable number of question marks over where the world is going. And so I will now turn to Professor Friedman, who will cheer us all up by talking about the future of war. <laughs> Lawrence. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk uh, a bit about uh, the issues I discussed in my article, which is uh, entitled The uh, uh, Rise and Fall of Great Power War. Um, but I first want to pick up the, the issues of international relations and history, um, because the, this period the, the, with which we start in the aftermath of the First World War was really the start of the study of international relations as a discipline. It, the, the, the idea for Chatham House was discussed at Versailles, as was the idea for the Council on Foreign Relations. The first chair of international relations at Aberystwyth uh, was a direct response. And it was based on the idea that if only we understood all of these things better, then this sort of thing shouldn't happen again. Um, and of course, when you hear that, you think, I'm always reminded of Peter Cook's observation when asked for the inspiration of the satire boom of the early 60s. He pointed to the clubs in Berlin during Weimar uh, and added, which did so much to stop the rise of Hitler. <laughs> um, so we, 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 can, we can start with um, a degree of humility um, about our own profession. Interestingly, students of international relations can't get enough 
of the origins of the First World War. They, they return to it time and time again, partly because it just isn't settled enough yeah. yet. So, so the endless possibility for experimentation with new theories. They spend very little time on the aftermath. Uh, the, 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 there aren't great international, I mean, there are works, but, but uh, there are works of international history, but not uh, of IR theory. IR theory is dominated by the origins of the First World War, Munich, the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, and now post 9-11. Um, and there's a sort of poverty of case study um, because unless you, all of these things, there's lots of information now, so you can go back to them. But what you don't have, and I think what this volume of this uh, edition of International Affairs is good at, is a sense of the stream of history, of, of context, how one thing leads to another, how you can't understand um, these issues without knowing what went before. And that, uh, which are issues of causation, uh, but the complexity of causation, because um, there's never one simple thing that leads you to where you are. And, and historians, of course, always like to point out um, the factors of chance and personality and so on that make a difference. Uh, but it isn't just that. I think, I, I think uh, unless, uh, for the, reason, the reasons that Margaret has just given in looking at uh, the arguments that took place about, around self-determination um, uh, at the time of Versailles and afterwards, history is very important in shaping people's sense of what is right and proper, uh, and also the question of norms. Um, the, uh, 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 Margaret also mentioned and, and, and makes this point strongly in, in her concluding essay with Patrick, um, there's a particular feature of the end of the First World War, which when one goes back to try to understand the rise of Hitler, obviously Versailles is often blamed for this and reparations and um, the, the determination to put blame on, on, uh, on Germany. It's, it's, it's one factor, obviously not the only. Another factor is the fact that Germany wasn't conquered. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, there was no real sense of defeat. Um, in the, the, uh, which gave rise to the uh, stab in the back theories. Um, and uh, it, it, one of the features of the First World War, and goes on to one of the points I try to make in my essay, is that it didn't make as much difference as you might think it should have done to thinking about how to conduct war. Um, the pre-war, pre-First World War thinking um, about warfare uh, had been dominated by the idea of a decisive battle. Uh, I think very shaped by the, uh, uh, the German victory uh, in 1870, somewhat forgetful about what happened after the German victory um, in terms of the uh, French resistance, um, but very concentrated on von, Mol von Moltke's achievement in getting a decisive battle. Um, and a decisive battle should lead to a decisive victory. It had political consequences. And that's clearly what the uh, German general staff was banking on um, at the start of the First World War. It's equally clearly what they didn't get. But the war ended, you could argue, with a decisive battle. It just wasn't a German victory. It was an Allied victory. Uh, Germ the, the German forces surrendered because they'd lost, um, because the Allied offensive was too much for them after their own offensive had failed. So the idea that, war, that, that, that great issues could be decided on the field of battle was not killed off by the First World War. Um, it carried on. Now, of course, what also came with this, but I don't think it was fully appreciated um, quite at the time of Versailles, though the papers were being written and the books were being written at the time, was the influence of air power. Um, because that had made brief appearances, but significant appearances during the First World War, and most important appearances had been in tactical uses. And it, to me, it remains an interesting question if the tactical role in scouting uh, and occasional su combat support uh, had dominated uh, air power thinking at the time. We might have been avoided quite a lot of distress later. But the idea 
that enemy morale was a quick route to victory uh, became uh, the, 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 the founding belief of air power. Uh, interestingly, not as strong in Germany, though they were the first ones to try it in the Second World War, uh, as it was in Britain and the United States, not to mention Italy, uh, which was the first country to have actually used air power to try to defeat an opponent. Uh, so you have, as a result of the First World War, a lingering belief in the idea that you can win these things by military means, combined with uh, uh, an, uh, a growing belief that winning now may involve civilian targets as much as um, military targets. Interestingly, when the Second World War came along, it actually, in many respects, once it got going, which obviously um, it, it took a while to get going, but once it did, it was sort of the way that the, the, the gen German general staff wished it had gone in, uh, in 1914. Quick victories um, in the spring of 1940 that took out uh, key members of the opposing alliance. Um, with the same problem that probably would have emerged had they had the same experience in, um, in 1914, though one can't be sure, which is other allies were still there and hadn't yet given up, which is one of the problems with getting a decisive victory. Um, that was the point at which the Germans turned to air power and reinforced the idea um, that this could be a way to break morale. Though they failed to do it, uh, nonetheless, the British and the Americans still took up the idea, um, partly because there wasn't much else they could do uh, in, uh, in, uh, until, uh, until Operation Torch and then D-Day. Uh, so it was a way of doing something to, to, uh, to show that the enemy was being attacked. Um, but it was still it wasn't by itself bringing victory. So there's an interesting speculation to be had about what might have happened um, had the nuclear, the atomic bomb, not been developed right at the end of the war. Um, if you look at some of the uh, initial commentary on the atomic bomb, um, it becomes clear that whatever the lessons people thought had been learned from the Second World War, they were pushed to one side uh, by the atomic bomb. Not actually in terms of the practice of what people, there were very few nuclear weapons around until, uh, until the end of the 40s. It um, didn't so much affect immediate plans, nobody expected a war. But the sense that grew, especially with the hydrogen bomb, thermonuclear weapons in the early 50s, that the next war really would be devastating, really would be too much, uh, seemed to me to be what, in the end, uh, killed off the idea of a decisive battle. Um, it, the more it became impossible to see how you would uh, survive uh, a nuclear war, the condition of mutual assured destruction, which follow, I mean, that was recognized following attempts to work out how you could have a decisive victory in nuclear war, and they, and they were never credible, and still aren't, I don't think, um, that credible. That seems to me as important as anything else. And one reason why I'm cautious about the idea uh, of Hathaway and Shapiro, uh, that it's norms that did it. I think common prudence did it. Um, uh, may, or maybe a combination of the two. Um, war just became too dangerous for the great powers. And if you couldn't conquer anyway, um, and, and wasn't any, I mean, because of decolonization, which again seems to me as important again as norms, there wasn't much you could conquer, and conquering had gone out of fashion. It was unprofitable. Uh, where's the gain? So that's why I think um, you end up without major war, and we still, amazingly, uh, after so long, uh, after the Second World War, have, uh, have not had another major war, though we talk about it a lot. What, of course, Versailles also reminded, in the aftermath of Versailles, is the potential for conflict arising out of these claims of self-determination um, and um, the contest 
to the contests over territory um, that, that, that were evident, um, uh, as has been, we've been reminded, uh, about was it four million who were killed in, in the period after the end of the First World War in the various conflicts that, that, that went on, uh, horrific numbers. Um, and if there was a comparison with the period after the end of the Cold War, it certainly wasn't that that created the conditions, I don't think it created the conditions for yet another, for another major war because of the way the end of the Cold War was handled. But certainly the breakup of states uh, created conditions for a lot more violence. So war is kept going by that means, uh, rather, we hope, uh, by the urge of major powers to fight it out for global domination. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so you've, you've both done a tremendous job of putting so much um, on the table for discussion. Uh, I'm going to just make one quick point and then open it up because really there's an array of arguments. I, I almost wish that Una Hathaway and Scott Shapiro we're here so that we can disagree with them uh, with them in the room because I think so many, they, they put such an interesting argument out there, but I find it almost impossible to, to take it very seriously, and yet it's a very serious argument. Nonetheless, I want to come back to something that both of you said, which, and I guess you didn't say it specifically, but, but you got it, you know, we haven't had another major war, and, and I was struck when you were talking about some of the similarities that one of the things that you know, we now go back to, not only 1919, but the whole interwar period for is thinking about um, the lessons, but also all the new things that happened because there had been a major war. The new ideas, the new laws, the new institutions, even the ones that failed, and a lot of that's discussed in the volume. And so it seems like the, 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 the difficulty in talking about today in light of 1919 and the interwar period is that it's that, you know, this is the international relations claim, right? It's that fact of major systemic war which makes the bubbling of all these new possibilities um, likely to happen. And it's, you know, we are kind of stuck with these incremental adjustments. And actually, despite all the similarities that you set out, sovereignty, geopolitics, populism or illiberalism or a sort of backlash, um, it's harder to grab at the positive things. I mean, one might say, you know, democracy's been uh, recharged as a result of some of the populist politics. If you look at the ACLU or different sort of, you know, Soros's injection of money into democracy across Europe, but nonetheless, it doesn't look like we have that cos that positive wellspring of things that that one saw, even the failed ones, and, and the very successful ones, like, like Chatham House. Um, but, but it doesn't seem like that's really there. And I guess Una Hathaway and Scott Shapiro, in some ways, you know, is, is sort of an interesting argument to bounce off. But rather than having you to respond to that right now, I'll have you come back to that maybe. I think since we only have about 20 minutes, and we have a lot of very well-educated people in the audience, um, if you say your name and your affiliation, and, and, and the gentleman, we'll start with the gentleman here. Thank you, Nick Westcott at SOAS. Now, that was fascinating. I wonder if you would agree that one thing that has stayed the same is human nature. Mm -hmm. And unless constrained by rules, uh, it will get out of hand, and that is a risk. And one thing that has changed is the role of ideology, which around uh, 100 years ago was primarily nationalist, which meant wars were between nations. Uh, now there is a different ideological driver, which means most wars are within nations or on an ideological basis, as you see in the Islamic State, and even political conflicts you know, like Brexit is an ideological movement. It's anti-materialist, whatever. But so there's a significant change, and that means the nature of war has changed. Thank you. And then one more just over here in the front. Um, Spencer Shea, currently an undergraduate at University College London. So China right now is a country that is actually acquiring their own sphere of influence. They also are perceived as a growing threat, an oversized threat, by the current hegemon, the US. A um, hundred years ago, a little bit more than a hundred years ago, Germany wanted its own place in the sun. It, was, it had a sense of nationalism, and it was perceived by the hegemon, the UK back then, as you know, a growing threat. So in this case, could we make the comparison? And if so, what lessons can we learn to, let's say, prevent a second you know, First World War style situation? Great. Um, well, let me start with that second question first, if, if I may. 
Um, I think, you know, there is this theory, um, Thucyst I never can pronounce it, Thucydides trap. Um, I just got it out, but, um, and there's this whole project at Harvard University which argues that it is more than likely almost not foreordained, but pretty close, that a rising power will fight a hegemonic one. And they use history. Um, I disagree a lot with it because I think the, the, the case studies are all open to interpretation. I mean, I look particularly at the case study of the First World War and, and because I knew that one best. And it can be simplified, but I think dangerously so. And I think we can think of examples where powers that were potentially in states where they might have come to conflict didn't. Um, I've just been reading a book on the, on the Congress of Vienna, and there was very serious talk towards the end of 19, 1814, rather, so I get my centuries mixed up, um, 1814, that they might resume fighting, that possibly Austria might go to war with Russia, and they didn't. And I think it was simply recognized that this would not benefit either of them. And did Britain and Germany go to war because of rising German power? You know, I think it's really debatable. I think there were a lot on both sides who said it was a natural alliance. Um, not just because of the royal families. In fact, the family thing was the least important. Um, but because they, um, you know, the one was the, what, Europe's greatest land power, the other was Europe's greatest and the world's greatest naval power, that they had a lot in common. They were not predominant, well, in the case of Britain, predominantly Protestant, but certainly the dominant power within Germany was predominantly Protestant. Um, they shared values of four members of the British cabinet in 1914 when Britain issued the ultimatum to Germany, had been educated in German universities. You know, so there, was, there were these personal links, I think, which were very, very important, but also links of trade, links of shared values, um, links of shared strategic interests. And so it is quite possible, and there were people certainly talking about it right up almost to the, the day that war was going to break out, about how Britain and Germany might sink their differences and, and actually come together. And there's a very interesting case, which I think people don't pay enough attention to, of the United States and Britain. Because the United States was also a rising power before 1914. And there was seriously talk about war over the Venezuela border issue. You know, it may have been loose talk, but loose talk can lead to war. And both Britain and the United States pulled back from the brink and came to a deal. And I think it is quite possible for great powers, you know, and I also find tricky. I mean, if you look, at, I, I've been reading the Peloponnesian War again. Um, you know, it's very difficult to actually say which is the rising power and which is the declining power. They were powers in different ways. You know, power is not something you can measure, like measuring uh, baking ingredients for making a cake. You know, what is it? What's it consist of? So anyway, I'm sorry, I've gone on a bit long, but I'll, I'll let Laurie say more about um, the drivers of war and, and human nature. Um, well, I'll, I'll stick my knife into Graham Allison a bit as well. Um, <laughs> Uh, so there's, very, there's a lot of reasons to worry, uh, and, and Margaret gave some of them, uh, about the implications of a rise in China and China's policy. The, Th the Thucydides trap is not one of them. Um, it, it's a misreading of Thucydides, um, a serious misreading of Thucydides. The case studies don't help. Um, they're, not, they're, they're not of nuclear powers, so they don't address that aspect um, of the issue. And why China and the United States? Why not China and India? Why not China and Japan? Um, and uh, as you, you mentioned, um, the, U the US and the UK, Cory Shaka has written an excellent book uh, on why it didn't happen with those two countries, and she, she traces it, and uh, partly, and this goes, leads into the other question, uh, due to common values. Um, and the more alike they became, uh, the less likely it was that they were going to war. Now, that has been turned into some sort of great international relations theory, uh, like all great international relations theory becomes undermined almost at the moment it's propounded, uh, uh, that democracies don't go to war with each other. Uh, then turns out that, well, it depends if the democracy is <laughs> in transition or not. Um, but the ideological element, the values element, does seem to me important. Um, and I think... What it is is a tension between the universalistic values, liberalism, if you like, but socialism in its own way too, and nationalism, um, which however you try to present it, uh, is, is obviously going to be somewhat narrower. Um, and there's, that's a continuing tension. I don't think it's gone away uh, because you know, a lot of 
not, it keeps on coming back and, and, and coming back at the moment in an even stronger form. It is one of the most powerful ideologies going and therefore poses the challenge uh, of how you respect that and understand that without succumbing to it all the time. We did have John Mearsheimer here today talking oh, about nationalism, <laughs> so we're well schooled. Um, a gentleman here in the front, and uh, if you wait for the mic, and then right at the very back. My name is John Preston, European section, Chatham House. Um, a phrase we're hearing a lot of now, but I think was used a lot back in 1919, was that of national sovereignty. Hmm. To such an extent that Japan and Germany and others left the League of Nations. I don't know quite what they did about the Paris Conference because they said it stopped their national uh, sovereignty, but then they went on to do something pretty horrendous. We've now got, you've mentioned China, but we've got the democratic, highly regarded United Kingdom suddenly getting very sensitive about its national sovereignty. Is there something naughty going to happen after the 29th of March? Don't answer that yet. <laughs> right at the very back. Ah, David Schofield, Murray Court Consulting. It's a truism, I guess, that history can give warnings to the present. And I was just wondering what warning you might draw from the events of 100 years ago if you were able to give a warning to, for example, the leadership of the United States to, 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 to name one country, if you could find anyone to listen. What warning, seriously, <laughs> would you offer to the American administration from the events of 100 years ago? And I don't speak specifically about what Woodrow Wilson did or didn't do. I was thinking of more general messages, if you could find someone to listen, that you, you might give to, to, to the current US administration. And, and then a third one right here in the front. And, and everybody will listen because we are on the record, and I believe we are live streams? Live streams, so we'll get plenty of Thanks. American Thanks, Ivan listening. Sedgwick, um, member of Chatham House, sometime historian, um, but not in a very distinguished way. Um, <laughs> arguably, um, 1919 ended the legitimacy of the the dynastic state of the empire, you've sort of referred to that, and the only real legitimacy after that, it took a while to unravel, was the ethnic nation state. And that process is still going on. The glass shattered, and it just kept shattering, and arguably, um, now sometimes with religious guys, that continues shattering. Have we reached the end of that process? Um, or is it just going to continue? Are we going, just going to see more and more claims of smaller and smaller groups to that. Obviously, the EU's been an attempt to stop it, um, and we know how that's going here. Thank you. Laurie? OK. Um, gosh. Um, so I think just taking the last question, um, multi I mean, part of the story of the 19th century is bits of states coming together to form greater states. Um, and then part of the story of the last century <coughs> was the pressure on multinational states, which hasn't, I mean, it's still there uh, because there are still multinational states, including ours, around. Um, and we've seen in this country um, that these points don't go away. Um, and there is a good argument that multinational states weren't that bad at all uh, as, as ways of uh, managing relations between different groups and minorities. Um, and often particular minorities got quite frightened uh, uh, with good reason when somebody much closer to home was going to be in charge of them. Um, but nonetheless, it was in that... It, it, it was always a, once you've got that idea of self-determination in your head, it doesn't go away very easily. And of course, you know, it leads, leads also to decolonization, which I think is, is, is the bit of um, 20th century history about which we tend to be most forgetful, though, though it in some ways is the most important. Um, so it doesn't, so there is a problem that, which is still continuing. And, and even China, uh, it's an issue for China. Uh, for India, it's an issue for the, the big states that we have. Um, 
it's still an issue. In the United States, it works out in different ways. So, uh, but obviously, they, they, they've been through that before. Um, and that re is relevant to the, to the question of sovereignty. I think it's also a question of democracy. I mean, I think it's a question of who, are, to whom are you, who is accountable to you? Um, and that is an issue with Brexit that, that, that has to be addressed. I think if you have a sense that the people doing things to you or for you or about you um, are not accountable to you, it, it is undermining. And however much one might try to demonstrate uh, the democratic character of the European Union, it doesn't quite work. So um, while um, there's a lot of mythology around sovereignty, in particular, the idea that being independent means you can impose your will uh, with others on others, which turns out not to be the case, as we may soon find. Um, uh, nonetheless, I think that the, the, there's an aspect of it which isn't just about nationalism, but is also about uh, accountability. Uh, two points, I think, just to, just to conclude. Um, first. Um, in trying to work out, I mean, uh, like Mark, I'm very wary of the lessons of history, despite having spent seven years of my life trying to find lessons af out of um, our last war. Um, the, because, uh, as Mark Twain didn't actually say, but it's a good phrase, uh, history doesn't repeat itself, it rhymes. Uh, uh, and, and I think one has to be very careful, so I'm, I'm always nervous about the lessons of history. I think one point that, that we tend to forget, we're, we're trying to all the reasons why uh, uh, the Third Reich appeared, um, and it's very hard to understand it without the Great Depression. Um, and that therefore, if we're looking at our own recent history, the financial crisis of 2007-8, I think is easily passed over by people in our fields who are often, with the ex notable exception, mum of Adam Tooze, um, not, often not very good at taking account of the economic dimensions uh, and the effect that has. Uh, so I think you know, one of the reasons why we're, we're still feeling a bit miserable and anxious at the moment um, is because the elites, the establishment, um, haven't had a very good time. Their, their record isn't great at the moment. Uh, and and, and you know, that, that's important, and that partly explains why Trump is there. Uh, perish the thought that I should ever be asked to give advice uh, to President Trump, um, I, whether I could find the right language to convince him of anything, I don't know. This would just end on, on one note. Um, I think Trump's instincts in international affairs, though I think as far as alliances and tariffs go, are really quite dangerous, um, are actually following a tendency in the American opinion and do reflect a reluctance, um, I think, to get involved in overseas wars. I just mean to say he won't get involved in them because um, of, of the way uh, his pride and saving face and so on may matter to him. But I think it's, it, 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 you can see this in a lot of the, the left-wing commentary on Trump at the moment, uh, as they think he's terrible and vile and evil and corrupt and so on. But he does have a point when it comes to Syria and Afghanistan. Um, and I think it's just important to keep in mind that even someone like Trump is a product of his time um, and is reflecting tendencies. And therefore, the hope that you find in Europe um, that when he's gone, it'll all go away, um, it seems to me maybe a little bit optimistic. I know I'm supposed to be optimistic, but I'm not very good at it. <laughs> Mark. Well, I think, I think your point, I mean, we're talking about two things here, the sort of basis, what makes the basis of a state? And there was an idea, certainly a very powerful idea in the course of the 19th century, that there was something called the nation, which was separate from the state, but founded, became, was the underpinning for it. And a lot of very bad history was written to show that there had always been something called the German nation, um, which was the only people capable of defeating the Romans, for example. You know, the, the whole one passage, tiny passage in Tacitus was taken to, to, to suggest this. Um, and lots of bad history is written to show that always been an English or a British or a Welsh nation. I mean, it, it's very possible to go back through history and pick out the things that um, make your case. 
but there was always a countervailing argument that the basis of a state was not ethnicity or not race, and the two were often used interchangeably then. And in fact, this was a very dangerous idea. The basis of the state was the acquiescence, willing acquiescence of the people who lived in it, and a certain acceptance of some shared values, but not all. And I think we still see that tension today. I mean, there is the argument that, you know, only Hungarians can be part of the Hungarian state, and, and it's being defined very narrowly at the moment by Viktor Orban and co. to mean only Christian Hungarians. <laughs> Um, and, and I think we can all see where this has led in the past and is likely to lead again. But I think there is another basis for a state, and, and it's the one that, that France has often had, and I think my own country, Canada, has, that if you come, come to this country, you accept the um, democratic procedures, you accept the constitution, you accept the rule of law, um, you can eat whatever you want, you can speak whatever language you want, um, although you are expected to know one of you know, the official language, but you can continue to have your own ethnicity, but you will be part of a greater whole, but you don't have to choose. And I think that is a much healthier basis for a state. And I think national sovereignty is one of these ideas which also has tensions in it. And, and I think it had a certain origin in the 17th century where, where it was agreed finally in, in the agreements that made up the Peace of Westphalia that states would not interfere in the internal affairs of other states. And that was because of what had been happening. And I think we then began to breach that. Certainly, we always did breach it. But in the 19th century, with humanitarian crusades, with the attempts to stop the Ottomans, for example, from oppressing their Christians, we recognized that national sovereignty was not absolute and inviolable. And I think we have this tension again today. I mean, where does national sovereignty begin and end? And where do other values come in? And, and where do we have other things we ought to be doing? The way that the, the, the discussion, certainly it seems to me, has been it's national sovereignty has been used in the whole debate over um, the fate of Britain and Europe is it's, 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 it's posited as something that is good, but nobody quite knows what it is. You know, it's something people want. It's a nice, shiny object. But when I talk to people who are for, for a hard leave, and they say, well, we'll get back our national sovereignty. And I say, what exactly do you mean? Because even North Korea doesn't have complete sovereignty. It has to deal with international agreements, and it has to worry about its big neighbors and so on. You know, so it seems to me that it's become a sort of shorthand for um, what people think they want. And I'm not sure they really know what they want. Um, advice to, to President Trump, I mean, I think as an historian, um, what I would say is that it is important to maintain your alliances. And alliances are not just pragmatic things that you happen to be going down the same path for two inches. Alliances depend on a lot of, of contact. They depend actually on a lot of history. They depend on personal relationships. But they depend on a certain amount of trust. And they are difficult to build and, and easier to destroy. And, and rebuilding them is not going to be easy. I think also what we're seeing, and this always happens, is we, we're seeing with the passage of time what people are remembering differs. I mean, one of the reasons we built up very strong international, like we in the West built up very strong international institutions after the Second World War, economic and political institutions, because the people who were building those institutions remembered what had happened in the 20s and 30s and why they needed them. And a very strong motive behind the European and initially coal and steel community and then the economic Union and, and finally the European Union was people remembered what had happened when Europe had been divided up by into comp competitive states. Those generations, generations pass and generations go, and people tend to forget why it was we wanted particular institutions. And so what we're remembering now is more recent. And I think what we're remembering, particularly in the United States, what they're remembering is is unsuccessful military adventures. They're remembering Afghanistan. They're remembering Iraq. They're forgetting perhaps earlier times when they exerted their power with, with rather more success. And so they're remembering, as people do, they're remembering the more recent history. And I think we're getting now, of course, I think you're absolutely right that what happened in 2008 was far more important politically and socially than we, we, we're just beginning to realize what that meant. And the loss of faith that people around the world had in their own institutions and their own elites and their own leaders, I think is profound. And I think we're seeing a cynicism now and a willingness of people to, um, you know, I think I may be wrong, but it struck me as one of the reasons people voted in the referendum for leave was they were just fed up with London. I mean, it wasn't Brussels so much, it was London and it was Westminster and they just wanted to show they were cross. And I do think that was an important part of it. And I think you see it. And I think there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a corrosive cynicism, which sometimes reminds me too much as an historian of what it was like in Weimar, Germany. And you know, the, the, if you don't trust your own institutions, then you will be at the mercy of those who are prepared to use that mistrust. 
um, for their own for their own ends. And so I think you know we are living through a period in which a number of things have happened to make people less confident um, in their own institutions and in their own futures. But that doesn't mean that we're not capable of renewal. I mean, this has happened before, and it seems to be one of the good signs is that we are now debating these issues and we're talking about them. And, and there is real concern, not just in an elite level, not just in fora such as this, but I think a real concern about where are we going, where should we be going, and how do we make our democracies more representative and more responsive? So. I'm, I'm modified optimism, so. We are right at the end of time. I know we had one gentleman who really wanted to ask a final question, so maybe it, I'll take two more questions and then really, uh, and, and then we'll let everybody go, um, because it's been tremendous. But the gentleman right here in the second row, um, right at the front, and then the gentleman right there. And, and keep your, if you keep your questions contained, that would be really great, right here. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Gordon Wilson, uh, fellow Rusi and uh, member here. Could you discuss uh, the importance or otherwise of the Washington Treaty, and um, which really was seen to control the super weapons of the day because of the battleship race leading up to the First World War, but it didn't last very long before it began to fall apart. Uh, the post-war treaties have uh, gone long, but now are we beginning to see the INF Treaty, for example, are we those those treaties falling apart, is there a parallel to be drawn or not? Great, thank you. I think we'll just stop with that, uh, unfortunately, because we're right at the top, so. Who would like to go? Well, uh, the Washington Treaty, the Naval Treaty, uh, is really interesting because it had this ratio of, um, of appropriate numbers of capital ships for uh, levels of power, and it caused more trouble than it was worth because um, it didn't take account of submarines and aircraft carriers, uh, and the Japanese felt slighted. Um, so uh, it, it didn't really help very much. Uh, it, it's why we, you know, the, the, the famous pocket battle, well, you know Gordon better than anybody, but the famous pocket battleships appeared. Um, but uh, it, it's a good example of why disarmament and arms control often have perverse effects. Uh, I don't think that's actually the case with the INF Treaty. I think mean, it's, it's problematic for different reasons. But you can look at other examples of arms control, say the Conventional Forces in Europe Treaty, which barely, I mean, which was dead almost as soon as it was signed because of the uh, breakup of the Soviet Union. Um, and it, I think it just the, the, the lesson in it is just to be very careful thinking through the political implications of arms control efforts. One of the, th I mean, the, the point about the Washington Treaty is that there's a direct relationship between the ratio of armaments and your standing as a great power. Um, and you see that in the strategic arms agreements, and it bears no relationship to the actual operational issues uh, behind the weaponry. Uh, and so it actually distorts programming and, uh, and procurement as a result. Not to say there aren't good arms control agreements, there are, but, but uh, that certainly wasn't one of them. Yeah. I've often thought if I can just add to that, I mean, with nuclear weapons, there is a sort of mystique about them, that possessing the bomb means that you count in a way that you wouldn't count otherwise. And, and North Korea is a very good example, but, but I think so, uh, so, uh, so is India, and Pac so are India and Pakistan. That, that, you know, they, the Indian Pakistan are perfectly capable, and they have done so, fighting each other with all sorts of, of armed forces. But somehow, it's something about your ranking. It's, it's what, what Yuen Fung Kong is talking about in his article, this idea of prestige. And it's not something you can measure, but if you have it, others are more likely to listen to you. And I think it, it, it really is something that, that um, is very difficult to control. There's a lot there. Um, it's been tremendous to have both of you with us tonight, as you can see um, from the audience and their questions and just the fact that we're all here. Thank you very much. And please join us in, in thanking our speakers.